So, does it record her voice? Okay. Are we good? Okay. Uh, I know all of you. I'm Monica Million. I'm the operations manager for the Grand Junction Regional Communication Center. And our study session today uh, is revolving around the NINA, NINA standards. Is anybody familiar with what standards are for a NINA? No? Okay. Well, then hopefully we'll educate you some. And if we get a chance, what we're going to do at the end is I'll show you on uh, Nina's website um, where you can access some of the standards information and where all the standards documents are kept up to date as a resource for um, all of us to utilize. So what is a Nina standard? It's Nina is Nina is an ANSI accredited standards developer. Who knows who ANSI is? American National Standards Institute. So about, um, I would guess, 10 years ago, roughly, both APCO and NINA began working with the American National Standards Institute to help professionalize and raise the, I would consider, the respectability of the documents that they were crafting. Uh, to make them industry recognizable and validated documents. Both APCO and NINA are ANSI standard creating organizations. Uh, NINA's standards tend to be more initially uh, technical in nature, but they have also begun to branch out in defining operational standards, and we'll talk about some of that. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit more about ANSI. Uh, ANSI uh, facilitates the development on standards by accrediting the procedures of standards developing organization. So to become an ANSI standard producing organization, you have to go through a pretty strict set of requirements. And in order to maintain the level of accreditation that ANSI provides, um, the standard developers are required to consistently adhere to a set of requirements. The hallmarks of the process include consensus that's reached by representatives from materially affected and interested parties. Some of this information may be on your exam about ANSI, NSI, American National Standards Institute. Um, standards are required to undergo public review when any member of the public and any member of the public may submit comments. Comments from the consensus body and public review commenters must be responded to in good faith, and an appeal process is required for the standards development. That was a lot of gobbledygook, good, right? Mm -hmm. um, it takes a while for any process to be accredited by ANSI, so it's time consuming, but that's because they're soliciting for all of this input and feedback, and then the organization originating the document is required to respond back to questions and concerns or issues generated by commenters and then redraft the document to effectively answer those questions and issues that are raised during that review process. Comments? Questions? Nina uh, has begun developing these standards as a resource to the industry. So when I talked about Nina began talking mostly about technical standards. Um, the most current or relevant one uh, today is the I3 standard, and that's what our next generation 911 system is supposed to be when you're talking about cloud structure. Um, Nina has developed this I3 standard from a technical standpoint that tells the industry professionals, these are the standards that you should be meeting in order to provide uh, infrastructure for the next generation network. And here's the blah, 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 one, two, three, four thing that you should be um, providing technically in order for the environment to be compatible to everybody. Now, is that in place now or are they yes. developing this? So it's already. I3 has already come out. Um, it came out mm, three years ago, Daryl. I3? Yeah. Yeah, around okay. three years ago. So. Uh, they're usually very cutting edge. One of the standard examples we're going to be going over is actually a hearing standard that Nina just updated. Um, 
but they they do. I remember telling you initially that they were primarily technical standards developers. Several years ago, Nina started it with uh, operations planning. I've been fortunate enough to be on the contingency planning standard, so um, developing standards for backup centers, things that would make us not be around, and what are the things that uh, we should have in place to ensure our continuity of operations. Um, and I recently, uh, just this last winter, worked on a succession planning document. So again, it's continuity of operations from a personnel perspective. So um, I know up here, there, currently there are seven committees that develop the standards. Accessibility, what do you guys think accessibility is about? ADA. I'm sorry, ADA. ADA. Yeah, it's a lot of the hearing impaired uh, requirements that uh, PSAPs should follow in order to, I'm sorry? Text messages. Uh, there, I'm, I'm sure they'll develop one. It has not been developed yet, but um, um, agency systems, core services, interconnection and security, the next Gen 91 transition planning, um, PSAP operations, and public, app, public education and PSAP training. So these are the seven different committees that develop standards within the NENA standard infrastructure. And I'll show you on the NENA website where we can where you can find those, who the committee chairs are, um, who these who make up these working groups, and you can actually volunteer to participate on these working groups by just shooting an email to one of the committee members. Oh wow, that was great. I, I had a feeling my questions would probably be answered here. Okay. Um, okay, so when it goes to the public, when when are these standards? Is there a certain time of year that, that these standards go out, or how does the public know? Uh, well, that is a comment that I, that's a question I'm going to have to get back with you on. Well, I know when the doc so when the documents are originally out for public comment, the organization, I know Nina puts out a public statement via their website. I haven't participated on too many apps. As a new though. member, if you're subscribed to their updates, you'll you'll get a. a is it Nina? The smart brief comes from Nina. Yeah, and get uh, your smart brief, and it has. You have to open it. It's not a garbage email. Right. <laughs> and read through it, and it'll have links to take you back there to review. Okay. In fact, their last one. I don't know if I can pull it up right now because I'm having computer issues, but the last one had several um, documents yes. that were in. What they call stable form, right. meaning they were ready for review. For review. Yeah. yeah, that the committees had come to a consensus on what it should say, and now they're looking for input from the membership. So I guess I'm just trying to understand the process. When you are setting standards, they have to go through rigorous qualifications through yes. ANSI, and all of these committees, these seven different committees, are the be all and all answer on a piece of operations or. NG911, or is there like a guiding I would, that I'm not starts? sure I qualified as end all beat all, but what, Nina, but what Nina tried to do was put together industry professionals who were developing sets of best practices. So I don't know that end all beat all is the right. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So, so as standards. industry professionals, I'm talking about uh, people uh, in the PSAP, uh, service providers, vendors. Uh, our users participate in these work groups that say we know what works best and we come to consensus on the language that the standard should recommend as a best practice. Okay. So, but we aren't there yet on standards like um, police have or ENTs have. We aren't there yet. We have best practices. APCO has actually published um, and I, I know you won't have an APCO question on your exam, but APCO has an ANSI standard for training uh, public safety telecommunicator. Okay. It is an ANSI standard. And, the, and again, APCO and NINA really partnered when they became an ANSI standard authorized documenter. I don't know if that's the best way to say that. Um, and it became part of their whole effort to professionalize our careers. 
um, to raise the bar because we were still considered, you know, clerical function kind of uh, employees. And in order to raise that, they felt that there needed to be a level of professionalism and a standard of documents and best practices. How do you standardize some of that information to elevate the industry? And they did that through this process. And this is acknowledging that it's always changing. Yeah. How oh, often do you guys and, get together? Um, these working groups are constantly working. And as we go through this, um, I'll show you annually at the NINA Development Conference is really where the working groups physically meet annually. Uh, oftentimes at some of the sub-conferences, if you will, like maybe a chapter conference or a critical issues forum, some of the working groups, depending on what kind of activity is going on with that standard, they'll side meet. But most formally, those committees, those working groups meet at the development conference each year. And that's really your opportunity if you want to go start volunteering to participate. Maybe there's a technical subject, maybe the GIS is your bailiwick and you really like it. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's a working group for um, GIS. But right now, these are the current document categories that Nina has. Um, accessibility documents we, talked, we touched on, PSAP equipment and systems documents, data structures and management documents, multi-line telephone system and PBX documents. I imagine that after this whole um, situation that the FCC is working through with uh, PBX systems of being unable to access 901, that standards group is probably going to be working pretty hard. Uh, networking documents, uh, NG, transit, NG 901 transition planning, security, VoIP, uh, I have NG. 91 documents, non-traditional documents, um, the PSAP operations contingency planning, the human resource document was a, a staffing model. I worked on that one several years ago. What's non-traditional documents? You know, another good question. That has to do mostly with non-traditional PSAPs, so that would be PSAPs that are not associated with a public entity, um, or not associated with a public safety entity. OnStar would be one, um, campus, campus dispatch centers, uh, some hospitals have their own PSEPs if they have a really big campus. So, so those are non-traditional PSEPs. It gives them a framework to build their organization around what people who have practiced in the industry have established as the best way to set up business for a non-traditional call center. Is that better explain that? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, public education and PSAP training, um, SOPs. There's a standard for SOPs, Tina, that might interest you as you're, if you're going to be the person responsible for helping to upgrade your guys' uh, policies. And then wireless 911 integration documents. So as you, it's like all over the board. It's uh, both personnel and technology related. And I just want to point out each of these, as it says, are categories. So each of these has, I'm looking at the SOP category right now, there's probably, without counting them, it looks like maybe 20 of them in there right now. That was a question. Yes. How many per category? And we'll be able to see that. Hopefully I'll be able to jump on the website here so you guys can see where all the documents reside. So, who changes these documents? We talked about the work groups. Annually, these groups are formed during the development conference. Volunteers are solicited for across the country, and subject matter experts can reach out to build a team of individuals across industry lines to review current documents or create new ones, as was the case with the I3 standard. So you had a set of industry professionals who were designing the blueprint, if you will, for what the standard framework for the cloud infrastructure should look like as we transition to next gen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of really cool. You're almost, you're really on the cutting edge. You're developing best practices. Um, in that particular case, you're, you're helping to evolve the new technology and how it will better serve us in our service delivery.
Okay, we're going to jump on to this. That's really all of my PowerPoint. It's not big because mostly what we're going to do is look at the website just to show you where you can get the documents. And hopefully, I can do that. Um, I'll tell you the most rewarding thing I did was go to one of the first, my very first um, NINA involvement was at what was there used to be called the ODC TDC, Operational Development Conference and Technical Development Conference. Um, and I went to the one in 2005, which was, or was it 2006? What was the year of Katrina? Six. Six. Five. 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 Yeah, so um, I actually was on the original working group that helped form the original TERT document. And that was pretty exciting stuff. And to this day, I am still on the review list. So every time that document gets updated, I get to touch it. I'm really proud of that. And it's a really impactful way for you guys to participate at just our level and have some impact at the national level on what is happening with our profession and how we're developing best practices. I highly encourage you to, to do that. While Monica's pulling that up, do you guys understand the difference between these standards and a, a um, legal requirement? Well, these are not, since these are, these are industry standards, but they're not a law, right? So right. even though they're an industry standard, there's no requirement unless, unless a law actually says you have to follow NEMA standard whatever then there's no requirement that you follow these. So they are, they're standards, but you know, you, you mentioned earlier best practices. They are kind of best practices because they're, they're voluntary for the most part. Um, the one, there, there are a couple that you will see sometimes written into laws. Uh, standard 02011 basically talks about how to, um, how to format alley services. And Colorado State, it's not in statute, but it's in PUC rules, say that, uh, 911 service providers, in our case CenturyLink, have to provide alley data in the this format, format. That, was create, that was created by nice. this NINA standard. So, you know, occasionally you'll see one written in law, but for the most part they're, they're voluntary. But I say that with a caveat too, because if, if you do something that creates some liability for the organization, you end up in a civil suit, it doesn't matter whether it's a law or not, if, if the plaintiff can say, you know, there's an industry standard that says that you're supposed to do it this way. You know, it, it's so it, at that point it's not a law, but it could it could leave you open for liability if you don't. It has if you it, don't it adhere potentially to it. has uh, civil litigation yeah. uh, consequences. So it's a good thing to know, and it sounds like there's a lot of them. Oh, okay. So here we are on the main Nina www.nina.org, and we're going to go right here to standards. Oh, I guess I don't have to look at that, right? List all standards. Here we go. So, again, here's the seven different working groups originally. And here are the list of all the documents. The year they were originally approved by their category. So, accessibility documents has five different um, standards. PSAP equipment and systems documents has two, three, four, five, six. Data structures and management documents. Standard for reporting and resolving any alley discrepancies and no records found for wireline, wireless, found for wireline, wireless, and void technologies. Okay. So a while back I was running a report uh -huh. and I went to your website. And I was looking up standards, and I wanted to find, you know, how long do you guys say someone should, it should take for someone to pick up a phone, get a call entered, and get someone there? Phone answering standard. Uh, where is it at? And that would be under. I guess I'm just trying to understand. Probably under operations. operations. Standard operating procedures. Minimum response to wireless 911 calls is the first one. Emergency call processing protocol standard. Wait, where did you go? Where are you at? That's okay. Down, very, very bottom. Oh, right here. Yeah. Call answering standard model, right here. Gotcha. Bam. We'll look at this one. You so, know, another thing to remember, too, is that 
NINA standards are not the only standards out there. Uh, for call answering times, I know a lot of agencies use the National Fire Protection Association standards. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's in 1710? Yeah. No. Is yeah. it 1710? NFPA 1710. Yeah, you can't pull that up unless you buy their freaking book. Yeah. That's one of the that's one of, that's one of the things they do. Yeah. Whereas Nina's, you can yeah, get them all free online. Somewhere. But they want you to oh, look at oh, it. You might be not get it for Your fire chiefs I mean, probably yeah. have it. Yeah, Boulder Fire. Your fire chiefs probably have it. Okay, so here's the call answering standard, Mike. Uh, model recommendations. Then we have our legal notice about it, about the document. Uh, and then Does of course, the legal notice like a disclaimer saying there's no uh, point to this. Pick up your oh. standard. <laughs> awesome. You're good. These are good questions. Yeah, they're very good. This standard document is published by Nina as an information source for designers, manufacturers, administrators, and operators of systems to be utilized for the purpose of processing emergency calls. It is not intended to. It is their disclaimer. Got it. Got it. And then the next, uh, where you have your acknowledgments, you've actually got the committee members are listed. Um, the one we have in front of us, uh, uh, Wendy Lively, John Haynes, who I've worked with a lot, Richard Ray is the ex uh, accessibility co uh, committee co-chair, Donna Platt. So people from the industry that are participating on this document, your name gets up in lights on the acknowledgment page. And then, of course, you have your table of contents. Ah, let's look at page eight. I think that's exactly what you're looking for, Michael. Benefits, definitions, glossary. And uh, I'm showing you a different one on the screen than you have in your hand. So under call taking standards, standards for answering now, 90% of all 911 calls arriving at the public safety answer point shall be answered within 10 seconds during the busy hour. 95% should be answered within 20 seconds. That is worded a little bit differently than, in F, than the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association standard. So, um, but this is free and easy to access and you are still falling well within the guidelines of what is considered a best practice if you would if you hold your people to this standard. Those are excellent resources. That's that's great. Yeah, and this is I mean you, that's the beauty of this um, the way they're keeping the standards and whoo I don't want to close it all. Don't go here, right? I do this every time. So if you need the back button. Good question. Yeah. You know, one thing I mentioned earlier is that it can, if if you're taken to court over something and they say, okay, you, here's a national standard from Nina and you didn't meet it, then that can create liability. It also goes the other way. If you do meet it, then it's really hard for someone to say, you know, you should have done more than than, than you did. You say, well, you know, we're meeting national standards. This is a this is a well-respected, nationally known uh, industry. Standard Development Organization that has um, that works with the American National Standards Institute, and so it gives it a lot of credibility to say, you know, this is the standard of our industry. We met it. We did what we were supposed to do, and that can really protect you. Right. So, if we wanted to go to the next level, with this, like, I mean, if there is a next level, as far as how are we doing anything, getting statistics or anything from other centers around saying, hey. Uh, Seventy percent of the centers in Colorado can actually meet this standard, and here's what we're doing. That'd be something we'd ask Daryl to do. Yeah. You know, we. He's not gonna like you. Pull out this kid. They, they. <laughs> some states really they do that. In Colorado, part of the issue is that there is no requirement that local call centers do any sort of reporting to a state body. I mean, I can do surveys and everything, but it's completely voluntary. It would be so, an, an interest, uh, it, in our, interesting thing for us to know. Like fun facts for comp centers. Well, why would they like, refuse you? I guess. Um, oh, we wouldn't. Well, on, keep on most surveys, I get about a 50% return rate, and yeah. it's because they're busy. They got other things to do. They don't have to do it. It's voluntary, so it gets put off and then just never gets done. Okay. Uh, in some states, it's a requirement that they have to report, you know, fill out reports to. 
uh, a some state body, but in Colorado we just don't have that. Because, okay. I mean, it, it just sounds like... Yeah. And technically, I think the PUC probably could could require that kind of reporting, but they've, they've never they done it. They've exercised that. Yeah. Now we could get that. We would want to go visit like centers. environment like ours yeah. right well I, I get uh, I mean standards are awesome best practice this, this is great and something I have to obviously read more of but um, how does it how does let us know how we're doing it, as a whole as we, a, we, if you, we yeah. use need on our reporting right now and that's one of the things I realized we need to go over because we haven't uh, well, we report out to come board in the 911 every month and we're trying to hit the NINA standard on call and train. Well, if you haven't spent any time to count on the reports of people, you should essentially right. really make yeah. all of the data that you've ever possibly got broke down by call genres. So I think, too, what Debbie's trying to explain, Michael, is that as managers, um, we do, we are required by our boards, even though there's maybe not a state reporting requirement, our boards are asking us for that kind of data, how are we performing to the industry standard? Because a lot of them, in most cases, don't even know an industry standard exists. Um, so a part of our responsibility when we're at board meetings is to educate them, one, there is a standard. Uh, guess what, and it's an ANSI standard, which um, elevates the credibility of it. Uh, and then thirdly, tell them what the standard is and how we'll report, how, will we, how are we measuring against it. Is that something you do, Val, for Lita, the reporting? Um, we do phone reports yes. to our board. Yeah. Um, nothing specifically where they're asking to show that we're meeting a NINA standard, but we do do monthly phone reports that we no, to them. A lot of these under the standard operating procedures can also be used as um, templates to create Later. your own standard operating procedures. One, one example uh, that, that Nina really pushed because they put it together with, in conjunction with the National uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children is their uh, Missing and Exploited Children Information Document. It basically gives guidelines on what PSAPs should, you know, how PSAPs should handle those types of calls. Right. You'd be surprised how many call centers don't have any written policy for how to handle is those types under, of situations. Is that under OPS? Yeah, that's under standard operating procedures. That's it's uh, about halfway down, 505. Yeah. You know, they have one on railroad and PSAP interaction, um, human trafficking. It's kind of it's a lot of stuff that, that PSAPs don't see very often, but it would be good for them to have something in writing on how to handle. This is actually a great protocol, I mean, a great standard to review to ensure you're actually meeting um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's standards for looking after the youth in our country. This is a great, it's the same material that they produced, but Nina made it a standard. So you're saying it's good to review standards on high risk but low frequency type calls? Oh, heck yeah. Because that's what that's what nips us in the rear end every time, right? That's what this is on the I will also share you from a technology standard perspective, my peer, our project manager, uses these standards when they're building our infrastructure to ensure that we're meeting industry standards as we're building out our networks. I know uh, Kemba does it too, for the, uh, so it, they're models. It gives you a blueprint, and I think for me, Michael, that's the best way for me to understand it. It gives you a blueprint to follow to create your own, to build your own system, whether it's from a human uh, asset perspective or a hardware perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So as you can see, there is a gazillion, there's not a gazillion, but there's a lot. Um, Monica, go look at the last one under the SOP category. Somebody mentioned earlier text to 911. And I think it's interesting you see those last three are numbered differently. For the last, you know, the, all of them had numbers, and this one was INF 007. What that means is that it's not a standard yet; it's just an informational document. And and they actually tell you that yeah. in terminology. But it gives you 
So, you know, they, on hot issues like that, it takes a long time to, to write a standard because there are a lot of people involved and they all have to agree on what the final version looks like. But sometimes on hot issues like this, they'll try to get something out faster and just make it a, so it'll be a little less formal, it'll be an informational document instead of a standard. Okay. And I noticed there's no disclaimer. It's the same. It's an information document. Yeah. It hasn't yet become a standard. And it hasn't gone through the ANSI process. it hasn't process. gone through the process. Yeah. So those committees that you've been on, do they have pretty good direction as far as, you know, you don't want to go back and forth for two years. Does right. somebody, somebody say, this is it? The, the one great thing that all, all of the working chairs are tasked to do is meet certain timelines. Um, you know, it, depending on the urgency of the topic, uh, succession planning, which we finished the document in April, we started on it in December, we were having weekly conference calls. Um, you have a pretty wide variety of people that are participating in these working groups. Not everybody can participate every week, or maybe you meet once a month, um, and you can do it all via conference phone. They make sure to be able to do that, and you can, uh, they, they were using GoToMeeting and um, Turbo, Turbo, no, what was the, oh, oh Turbo Bridge. Turbo Bridge, uh, Nina was using that as one of their websites to put up common material. We would craft some language, we agreed on it. Uh, the working chair is required to put it in the document format, then we all try to scribe on it. It's however you can contribute, uh, but they are held to a certain timeline, and the chairs do a pretty good job of holding our feet to the fire. And if you can't participate that week, you just listen to everybody else's input and move on. But it is a great way to contribute to what's happening in our world, especially if you like this kind of stuff. Can we talk about NDC, the Nina Development Conference? Yeah. So every year, they, Nina has a conference uh, called NDC. Yeah, it used I, to be the sorry. ODC and TDC. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's specifically, it's a conference, but it's a working conference, and the specific purpose of it. Because these committees work throughout the year by conference call, right. but the purpose of these of the NDC is to give a, a, a place and time for all the committees to physically come together and work on stuff face to face. Because you can get a lot more done than you can on just a conference call. Why don't they do that at national? So you know what? Because have to travel one more place. I think because the the mission of those conferences are two separate deals. Really, the national conference is about training and education, and really the development conference is, it is a working group. Like, you will sit down. Um, I've only been to three in the last 10 years, and blew on me, but I've been participating annually on some kind of working group. Um, but you actually are in a room, and you muscle through it, and you cuss and discuss, and uh, draw out your plan on the board, and it's actually, if you like that kind of engagement with a work group, it's really fun. But really, it's about, um, it's, I think the purpose is so different that you couldn't do it simultaneously. That's fine. How long is that conference? Like two days, three days. Three days. And uh, it's, it's going to be in October next mm -hmm. year, too, right? October this yeah, year. Yeah, it's unfortunate because the, it, it's right up against the state APCO NIDA yeah. conference, so I probably won't go this year. Um, and actually, we're talking about changing our week of our state conference because of this. This is a recent change. Oh, really? They used to do the development conference in the spring, like in February mm -hmm. or March. And just this, I think this is the first year they're doing it in the fall. And they did it in the fall because everybody said other conferences were in the spring and, or in summer. So the professional organizations were trying to spread the conferences out. So. Uh, unfortunately for us in the state of Colorado, that's when our state conference is, so now this year it butts right up against it, so it becomes really difficult to participate. How difficult is it to get involved with this as far as we can? Not at all. Really? Just uh, that simple? It is that simple. Uh, they I usually was, need people. Yeah, they, they don't have enough people contributing. contributing. They don't have enough people contributing. And if you ever do go to the Nina Development Conference and you go to one of the, the sessions, they'll send around a a sign up sheet, you put your name and an email address on there, and guess what? You're on a committee. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really not that hard. Yeah. Okay. 
and I have as easily as found the, the chair through clicking on the document here on the website right. and said, you know what, I have something to contribute to that. I want to hear what they're talking about. Contacted the chair and said, yo, I want to play. And they include you. You don't have to do it at the national conference. You can do it as right. easily as communicating with them. That's and you need to tell them, yo, I am an industry professional. Here's the agency I work for because they still want that level of input. Right. But um, it's that simple. It's that simple. Questions? So, looking at our standard, so I tried to pick a new one, kind of simple, give you a paper copy of one. You've got your disclaimer. Uh, the second page is your acknowledgement. So, the people who are participating who help build the standard. You've got your table of contents. I'm on page five, uh, your executive overview. Continuing on, reason for issue or reissue, why they had to update the document, cost recovery considerations, intellectual property rights. So you really pretty much get all the information you need to have to become a best practice user, model follower. Um, acronyms and abbreviations that can be found in the standard. And then finally, by the time you get halfway through the standard, you're into the meat and potatoes of the information. So on here I'm on page eight, uh, where we're at hearing standards for public safety telecommunicators. And position requirements, medical evaluation. So these are all recommended ways that we should be evaluating the hearing for people in our profession. Sound, audiology, audiometric speech discrimination, hearing conservation utilization under that utilization of noise reduction headsets. I'm sorry? Oh. Uh. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Did you get I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't even remember having it. Let's put the camera around. We didn't I, so I will tell you that this standard tells you as an agency recruiting you should be you should be you should institute a hearing test. Because how do people how can you help uh, an employee who has a hearing disability be, be a good employee? This isn't about testing them out of the process. This is ensuring that, number one, you're providing the tools, like noise-reducing headsets, recommended, that's a recommended practice, and then uh, the standard of testing for hearing. Because I do know that there, in the past, I think of one, where they to avoid discrimination unless they can demonstrate that doing so would fundamentally alter the nature of the service program or activity being provided. Reasonable accommodations include headsets with built-in amplification, hearing aids, or cochlear implants. Cochlear implants, isn't that a freaking surgery? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And we're, you're that, saying we're, the standard we're says, to offer it. have you ever read the ADA rule? Wow. Yeah. So I, if you haven't had that segment yet, uh, <laughs> for your labor laws? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And the standard says that it is a reasonable accommodation. Uh, best industry, best practice, industry best practice says. And you will find when you have the module regarding labor laws. We have covered that. No, you have not. Okay. So. Questions? Comments? Uh, I feel like I'll be 10 times more knowledgeable just by reading yeah, this. I agree. I gotta tell you, one of the best things I ever did first was to participate. And I went to the then ODC without even ever knowing what all of this was. Becoming 
made aware that there was this group of people, my peers across the country, who were writing documents to record best practices, and then finding out that it was at my fingertips. So sometimes on graveyards, when I was working nights, I would, if I was bored, I was like, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm gonna read that. And that was the way I helped educate myself, especially in technology. Oh, you can tell your stuff. Yeah. And then how do I, and then if we want to make our center better, we want to be a recognized industry leader, we're doing the best practice. And you do that by advertising and educating your authorities, your boards, your chiefs, whomever your uh, executive leadership is, that you are meeting industry standards. And, and the thing that gave these documents more impact is the fact that they are certified through the ANSI process, the American National Standards Institute process. So coming from my private sector manufacturing experience, ANSI standards are followed meticulously in the creation of parts, processes, in the manufacturing environment. So I was very familiar with ANSI before APCO and NINA. I was just for my private sector manufacturing. Any organization who is producing documents, standards documents, who wants to be a credible, highly held or highly respected document is an ANSI standard because it is it is highly scrutinized it's a very detailed process and it's hard it's hard to get through so these documents mean something they have more value I think make sense yep. okay if you don't have any more questions that's all I got one, How long did I take? Just one thing I want to mention. Another, another use for these standards is if you are in the process of purchasing equipment for a call center. Um, I'm looking specifically at things like, um, they've got one for emergency notification systems, they've got one for uh, recording, systems. We just recording, systems, recording systems, one for the, uh, the net clock that a lot of dispatch centers will have in their, in their facility. The, you can use those standards in RFPs and say, you know, if you want to make a proposal to sell us equipment for this, for this need that we have, you have to meet NEMA standards. That way, you know that all of the proposals you get, if they say we meet NEMA standards, it automatically covers everything that was ticked off in that standard. Yeah. So that's a, a, a good shortcut that a lot of uh, agencies will use to, to write their RFPs. Yeah, and that's what I indicated. That's what Paula, my peer, does. We use these standards when we're doing procurements we, to ensure that we're meeting what the industry considers the best practice. And for purposes of the test, you know, the best thing you can do is just look through these uh, and be kind of familiar. You don't have to memorize yeah. you know, any of them or, or what's in them. Uh, but just be kind of familiar with what the broad categories are, what kind of things they cover, and um, you know what they're for. It's basically what we talked about today. Yeah, I, that's the only thing that might come up on the test. If I recall, there there was a question. Um, I know I was asked about the categories, the seven high level categories. So you don't, you know, they're not going to say what is ANS, what is standard 05-341. They're not going to ask a question like that. But just what are the I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. But Daryl's right. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we got. That was an easy one. There's not a lot to this. Are you gonna edit? Are you gonna edit that? I am. Because I just went. Oh, there's not a lot to that one. I'm gonna leave that part in though.